Well, I want to say hi to the people who are watching us via live stream, or if you are watching this in the sermon archive, someday hence from now. We pray that this will be a blessing for you just as much as it is for the people who are here live, right? Well, it is good to be back among you, and I have to tell you that in all my years as the mission pastor here at Lake Grove, this is the first time that I was a part of two international mission trips so close together. I was in Honduras first, and Zambia soon thereafter, all within the last month. And I saw God at work in multiple ways in both places, and uh, my experiences shaped how I read today's passages, and I want to share some of it with you. You see, in, in both places, I saw people trying to do what Paul is trying to do in 2 Timothy, trying to inspire the next generation and hand off responsibility to them. So get ready for some stories about living well, as our sermon series is called, uh, stories from Central America and from Southern Africa. We're picking up Paul's words to Timothy in chapter 3 of the second letter, Starting at verse 10, let's see what God has for us. Now, you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and suffering the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from them all, from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, indeed. You know, as I uh, read the first verse of today's text, my mind wants to put it in the mouths of the parents I met in Bea Vista, Honduras. Bea Vista, meaning beautiful view. And you, you can see a beautiful view. If it weren't so bright in here, you could see a beautiful view. It is beautiful from that village. And it's a village that didn't even exist 10 years ago. It's now a vibrant community of over 150 citizens, and I want to tell you that they know about Lake Grove Church, and they thank God for us, and they pray for us because they regard Lake Grove as God's agents in helping them found their village, in helping them move from abject poverty when they were working from day to day, unsure of how they would be able to provide for their family even through the end of the week, no security, virtually no hope. They've moved on from that now to owning their own land, working their own fields uh, with an opportunity to offer their children an inheritance. 
Um, so they have gone from anxious and hopeless to confident and full of hope. Um, and these folks, with the help of our mission partners at Agros International and with your generosity, have literally stepped out of the darkness and into a bright future. And I hope that the illustrative photos you're, you'll be seeing here, um, which are from our recent trip at the end of June, uh, I hope they'll help tell the story. It was our farewell celebration. And although they didn't want us to say farewell, they begged us to come back again. They also said, if you don't, please rest assured that we're going to be okay. We can do it on our own now. And that was encouraging. So you see that the village is festive, was festively decorated with balloons and streamers and palm branches. I think I ought to tell you that uh, our teams thought that our team thought that I needed a Spanish language name for the trip, and so the obvious choice was Gregorio, uh, which is nice. And then uh, our best Spanish speaker on the team, Linda Brug, told me that uh, the nickname for Gregorio is Goyo, and that's okay too. But at least one of our team members had difficulty with that and called me Pastor Gordo instead. <laughs> Do you speak, you speak Spanish? <laughs> the Spanish speakers, start, they started laughing just like you did, and they, they told me that Gordo means something like fatty. So, so <laughs> they were calling me Pastor Fatty, which my Christ-like team members latched onto and reminded me of over and over again. They assured me it's more than just a description. Oh, it's also a term of endearment. <laughs> and then we, we got to Zambia, and, and um, there they call me old man, <laughs> which is also a term of endearment and respect. Right, John and Darius? Yes, of course. That's what they tell me. It, it really is good to be back home where at least you hide it. You, know, you, don't, you don't say it out loud. <laughs> but back to the text. You know, uh, let me paraphrase verse 10 as if it were from Bay of Easton parents to their children. They could be saying, uh, young people, please observe our teaching, our conduct, our aim in life, our faith, patience, love, steadfastness, and our persecutions and suffering, the things that happened to us in San Pedro Sula, one of the most dangerous cities in the world in Santa Barbara, down the hill, and even here in the hills of Bea Vista. What suffering we endured, they might say. Swindlers in the city, bug infestations and coffee fungus in the country, dengue fever. Yet we want you to know that the Lord has rescued us from them all. That's the testimony that family after family shared with us. And they share it with their children as if they were, like Paul was saying to his young protege, Timothy, the elders of Bea Vista testify to their young people, yes, even God's people are not spared suffering, but God has been faithful to us, and so we are going to teach with our words and with our example. And you, just as it says in verse 14, you, we want you to continue in what you are learning and what you have believed firmly, trusting it because it comes from us, your loving family and community. Family after family shared with us about their before and after, from nothing to relative plenty. Um, and they wanted to share it with their kids, along with their faith and their values and their best practices. And so, for example, we visited the family of a man named Luis Alonso and his wife, Hilaria. We were in their home, and I don't have good pictures from that visit, but I have pictures of Luis and some of his family. And he told us how he had nothing before until he learned about this opportunity through Agros. But now he and his wife not only have land, but they have a sense of purpose, not just for themselves, but for their children and grandchildren. Luis is a part of Bea Vista's leadership. Uh, he has been president of the, of the board there and also 
of the Coffee Growers Association. And now he is intentionally pulling his son Nelson into these activities. And Nelson is also emerging as a leader of the next generation. He, Nelson comprehends economic things. And so, for example, he gave a report to the gathered community when we were there and shared strategies for how they're gonna, how they're gonna continue to grow and do better economically. And Nelson and his wife have their own next generation, a little daughter, to whom they also will say, as Paul said to Timothy, pay attention to our teaching, our conduct, our aim in life, and our faith, and so on. And thus, the cycle of life and faith and discipleship continues in Bea Vista. Or let me introduce you to Carlos and Marina, or reintroduce you because some of you will recognize them. They visited our church uh, about five years ago. Carlos and Marina live in one of the first houses you see as you come off the mountain road and enter Bea Vista. Uh, Before coming to Bea Vista, they experienced the truth of verse 13 because they were deceived by wicked people and imposters. In their efforts to leave the slums of Los Bordos in San Pedro Sula, they used the meager savings they had accumulated to invest in a cheap plot of land where they built a simple home structure out of wood and plastic. No sooner had they built the home than the police arrived and drove them away, told them they did not own that land. It was all a scam. They tore down their house. They lost everything, not just the land, not just the house but the money they had invested in the land. There was no justice. And Marina says, we lost all hope. But they did not lose their faith in God and they immediately started praying for help. And that's when they heard about agros and the potential for land ownership, enough land to even be able to do their own farming. It sounded too good to be true given their experience, so this time they carefully investigated the opportunity and the organization. They went and visited other already existing Agros villages. And the villagers there told them, it's not too good to be true. It's really happening. Happening. It's both good and true. And now Marina says, at least she said at the end of June, she said, our dreams are coming true. And she and her husband Carlos are growing in grace and favor in that village developing from young Timothy types who learned from older farmers and agros experts and now becoming experts in their own right, taking over the Paul position and handing off Christian faith and practice to younger people and their own children in the community. I have one more example from Bea Vista, and it's the teachers who staff the simple two-room school built with your support. In fact, our name is there on the school in multiple places. You can even make it out just behind uh, Sergio, the teacher in the red shirt, behind his left leg, you can make out Lake Grove there. Um, Sergio and Rita, the teachers, are not members of the Bea Vista Co-op, but uh, they live up the hill with their families, their own families, but they're definitely part of the Bea Vista family because of their commitment to the school children, not all of whom are from uh, the Bea Vista village. Some come from the surrounding area. Teachers, of course, are, are almost by definition in a mentoring relationship with their pupils. They're helping the children grow by word and deed and teaching them to live well, again, using the language of our sermon series. Sergio, in particular, seems committed to the Bea Vista community. He's taught there for several years, even before there was a school building. He was teaching first on someone's porch, and then in the tiny community center there, and now he has his own classroom. It was Sergio who orchestrated, or at least emceed, the celebration and signing ceremony, along with the Agros staff. And our mission team was touched that Sergio thought enough of what was going on to bring his whole family to this multiple hour long celebration. 
And even though the other teacher, Rita, did not bring her family, I noticed that multiple times she was moved to tears by the signing ceremony and the expressions of mutual appreciation uh, that went back and forth. Teachers are mentors to many little Timothys in Bea Vista. Hallelujah for that. And I thank God for all of you who are teachers in our school systems and uh, maybe especially for those of you who are committed to discipling our kids in Sunday school and the children's ministry here. Anyway, I came away from Bea Vista encouraged by the depth of the Christian faith dimension in the, in the whole enterprise and also impressed by the intentionality of the mentoring from one generation on to the next and even to the next. There were often three generations represented in these families with the seniors eager to pass along the art of living well and eager to remind their children and their grandchildren of verse 14 to continue in what they've learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom they had learned it. Thanks be to God. I returned from Honduras on the weekend. I was with you in worship on July 1st and then departed on July 5th with uh, members of a team from our wonderful partners, Water Africa, to see how God is using clean water and sanitation and enhanced hygiene practices to change and save lives in southern Zambia under the auspices of our, our wonderful partners from World Vision. I got back this past Tuesday. I see Ward Hubble down here. I think he got back Thursday? Thursday. So, and he's here in church despite jet lag. Of course, it's the middle of the day for you right now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, went with this wonderful team, and along the way, uh, I was able to visit our partner villages in Sinazongwe, which is a familiar uh, place for many of you. We were with men and women who are focused on saving lives in a different way the pastors and their wives, the pastors and community leaders of Siabaswi village and Siabeula village. Um, and this brings us to the second part of our passage, I think starting perhaps at verse 15 of chapter 3 and continuing right to the end. Paul reminds Timothy how the Old Testament writings had shaped him as he grew up and brought him to a saving relationship with God as he put his trust or faith in Christ. Paul and Timothy, of course, when he talks about sacred writings, he's talking about the Hebrew scriptures only, the Old Testament. We also have the New Testament, uh, stories of Jesus and the early church. So our scriptures are even more comprehensive, perhaps stronger, for the purpose of bringing us to salvation through faith in Christ. Paul pauses after verse 15 there, and in verse 16 kind of iconic verse, a foundational concept he shares with Timothy, saying, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. For whom? For everyone who belongs to God. Not just for Timothy, not just for church leaders. For everyone who belongs to God so that we may be proficient and equipped for every good work. It's a great verse. And you know, um, I know that if Pastor Mark were here, he would want me to, to zero in for a moment on one of the Greek words there in verse 16. <laughs> By the way, you know, we talked about Greek words before Mark got here, don't you? <laughs> this is not a new thing. And there's a great one there. Uh, it's represented by three words in English, inspired by God. But in Greek, it's just one word. Theopneustos, or God breathed. And if you envision that word, you can see roots in our own English words there. Theo, for God, as in theology. And I say pneustos, maybe that's how they said it years ago. We tend to have the P be silent and say words like pneumatic or even pneumonia. Uh, the word means breath, wind, spirit. Uh, maybe some of you even remember that old word, pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcanoconiosis. <laughs> Did any of you learn that when you were kids? No. It's a lung disease caused by inhaling fine ash 
and sand, and it has all sorts of Greek words in there. But what Paul is saying is Scripture is God-breathed, all Scripture, and it's useful for training in righteousness, a righteousness for all of us, balanced by grace and truth. Well, so I met with two groups of pastors who are very interested in that concept and in Scripture. They want to learn more about Scripture. They want to proclaim the message of the inspired Word of God. And the first group from Siapeula, kind of a progressive group, they are farming as a co-op, which is practically unheard of in Zambia, where they usually just farm their own little plots. But they're doing this countercultural thing of collaborating. Now they're also elevating the status of their women, which is also ahead of the curve in their, in their culture. These pastors all brought their wives to the gathering, the first time they've done that. And they told us that their wives now attend their weekly interdenominational pastor fellowship, which is also a new development. They told us how they're working together better than ever intentionally swapping pulpits, rotating the preaching, breaking down denominational walls because it's all about proclaiming Christ. And uh, so their unity is enhanced better than ever before. They also said candidly that um, they could do the work that Paul was telling them to do in 2 Timothy better if they had more Bibles in the Tonga language. Um, now, Lake Grove has, has provided many hundreds of Bibles in Tonga over the years, and um, we would have provided more this time as well, but they were not in stock in the capital city of Lusaka. So that'll have to come another day. I continued this discussion the next day with a second group of pastors. We met outdoors under the beautiful tamarind tree next to the Church of Christ in our original partner village, Siabaswi. And after some worship together, including the church choir, I read to them from this passage that we're talking about today. And they were inspired by the, the word of all scripture being God-breathed. And then I asked them about verses three and four of chapter four. I read this to them. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having Itching ears, they'll find for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. And I looked at them and I said, this is happening a lot in my country. How about here? And they all nodded. And we were troubled about this together. We prayed about it. We were troubled too by the tendency of some followers of Jesus who seem to pick and choose their favorite passages of scripture and ignore the ones they don't like as much. You know what I mean? <laughs> Do you ever have that temptation? And so the pastors there have rhetorically asked, if all scripture is God-breathed and useful, mustn't we take it all seriously? Mustn't we try to learn from all of it? So, we challenged one another, as Paul challenged Timothy, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, verse 1 of chapter 4, to persist in proclaiming the message, whether the times are favorable or unfavorable, um, to convince and, and even rebuke, that doesn't happen much here, and to encourage our people with utmost patience, as it says in verse 2. And we said, we recognize that people are going to wander away to less demanding paths, desiring to be masters of their own destiny, a self-designed destiny. That's kind of what the implication is of verses 3 and 4. But we challenge one another to continue with sound doctrine, verse 3, to remain clear-minded, that's what, that's what that word sober means in verse 5, and to endure the inevitable suffering that comes with trying obediently to follow Jesus and to continue as the passage ends and continue in the work of the good news. That's what an evangelist does. It's the good news giver carrying out our ministry fully and faithfully. And we prayed together and then we said goodbye. 
And I promised to try to visit them one more time when the World Vision program closes down in the year 2020. In the meantime, this will interest you, we said we would try to stay in touch via Facebook. This was unheard of just a few years ago. Because there's one pastor there, there he is with his family, that's the, his church behind us there. This pastor, Katema, contacts me regularly via Facebook, and he's going to set up a Facebook group for the Sinazongwe pastors and me to be in dialogue so that this gray-haired Paul type can try to encourage those generally much younger Timothy types in Sinazongwe. Thanks be to God. And so I return to you from Central America and Southern Africa, strengthened and encouraged, wanting to tell you that our mission work there continues to bear fruit. And isn't it great to know that there are people in Honduras praying for us regularly, maybe right now. And I can guarantee you that people in Zambia who are nine hours ahead of us have prayed for us already today. And isn't it great to know that we are one in Christ? They are committed as we are, I believe, to growing in Christ by word and deed, following Paul's and Timothy's examples. They are learning the scriptures and going deep into the word, yes, but they're also intentional about living out the gospel in their deeds, in their behavior, and passing it along to the generations coming up after them. They have their Paul's and their Timothy's just like we do. And just as we have articulated core values like passionately preaching the timeless truth of God's word and joyfully and intentionally discipling our children and youth, that's word and deed, our partners are in this missional enterprise with us. So as I close now and you reflect on the meaning of today's passage in your own life, of course, one practical step is for us to think about who our Pauls are or have been and what we've learned from them and who our Timothys are that we're passing things on to. But maybe the, the best takeaway is just to look at the text itself. Just the very beginning of the text and the very end of the text. Um, verse 10 of chapter 3, you could just change that a little around to ask, address it about yourself. Who's observing my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, patience, my love, my steadfastness, and how I deal with suffering? Who's watching that in my life? And then the very end of the last verse for today, we can make that into a question that says, how am I carrying out my ministry faithfully? God gives us all ministry, right? Not just the pastors and the professional Christians. So those two questions. May God's spirit bug you until you know the answers to those questions. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen?